humanity. Today, we'll be exploring the vehicles the Covenant uses and their skirmishes across the Milky Way. More specifically, in today's video, we're looking at the vehicles and their names that have their origins with the animals that we see here on Earth, the Locust and the Scarab. Starting off our excavation is the Covenant's Tier 1 Light Excavator, the Locust. First appearing in Halo Wars in 2009, the Locust is a quadrupedal mining platform that was utilized as an assault and anti-fortification vehicle. Standing at 22 feet in height and armed with a singular light plasma cannon, the Locust is a powerful little vehicle that is extremely capable. Though this vehicle is fairly similar in purpose to the larger excavators like the Scarabs, it's only capable of fitting a singular pilot and relies on the driver to manage its shielding, movement, and weaponry. Unsurprisingly, the capabilities of this vehicle were employed by the Banish in their reign after the fall of the Covenant, as seen with the Barukaza workshop variant in Halo Wars 2. As this vehicle is highly mobile and is extremely powerful, especially in swarms, it's fitting to be called the Locust, as the insect sports not only a similar look, but as well, a capacity for destruction. Belonging to the family Acrididae, locusts are actually short-horned grasshoppers that are in a swarming phase in their year-long life cycle. This phase happens for multiple reasons, but primarily stems from an uptick in vegetation growth and population growth, either before or after a drought. In their swarming phase, they number in the millions and become extremely voracious, eating away vegetation and leaving the land bare in a single day. Though they are better managed these days, in ancient times locusts were seen as terrifying acts of the gods, taking away the lives and the means to live from those who were believed to have sinned or fallen from the good graces of the gods. Within the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the swarm of the locust has been seen as a plague upon the land alongside nine others. As explained in Exodus chapter 10, lines 12 through 19, Moses stretches out his staff and begins the plague of locusts upon Egypt, covering nearly every square inch of the land with locusts and leaving nothing but devastation. As well, the book of Revelation actually mentions locusts in chapter 9, lines 3 through 7, where they are depicted as chimeric monsters flying to earth from the sky, having a horse-like body, a human's head, and the tail of a scorpion. Here, more devastation would be wrought on the people, not by eating the vegetation, but through the torture of those deemed unworthy of entering heaven. For ancient Egypt, the people and the land were ultimately the ones who faced the wrath of swarming locusts, seeing death and devastation brought on by these unassuming insects. Though this depiction of the deadly swarm wasn't always there, as many tombs and wall paintings of Egypt's wildlife depict the locusts living simply along the Nile's delta, specifically in Pharaoh Horemhab's tomb dating back to the 12th century BCE, artists painted a beautiful mural of the wildlife, including a solitary grasshopper during one of the pharaoh's many hunts. As well, the Greeks would even find the swarming nature of the locusts to be worthwhile in their stories. Specifically in Homer's Iliad, he makes mention of how locusts swarm and fly away from fire and heat diving into the water to avoid it and causing their own death. However, I should say that Homer isn't specifically talking about locusts here, but uses them metaphorically to express the movement and the deaths of the Greek soldiers against the might of Hector and his army during the Battle of Troy, supplying the reader with, again, an account of death and devastation. As the Covenant sought out Forerunner artifacts across multiple planets spanning the Orion arm of the Milky Way, they employed different excavators for different roles, with the Locusts being the first tier and 
minor, but more precise diggers in acquiring Forerunner tools, the Tier 4 excavators far outweighed and outshined the more personal platforms with the Scarab, a quite literal monster of a vehicle. Before we get into it, if you're interested in supporting the channel and seeing exclusive content, then consider becoming a patron. Be sure to click on that link in the description. And now, back to it. First appearing in Halo 2 with the Protoss Pattern Scarab, it's classified as an ultra-heavy assault and mining platform. As one of the largest of the excavators and assault platforms, it stands at an average height of 150 feet. Being typically equipped with an ultra heavy plasma focus cannon and two heavy plasma repeaters, as well as being quadrupedal, meaning that the Scarab could cross most terrain without much trouble. What makes the Scarab unique among the tools and vehicles used by the Covenant is that it's actually operated by a subsistence of the Legolo. Yes, the same species as the hunters, making the Scarab essentially a hunter. Though many of the Scarabs did have an operator inside, they did not drive the Scarab in a typical sense, instead only suggesting or directing where the vehicle needed to go and fire at. See, the Rulo Legolo is a subsistence gestalt of the Legolo and were actually engineered to solely operate the dexterous vehicle of the Scarab. This is in part how the Scarab is able to move with such finesse and dexterity over buildings and mountain ranges. In all honesty, the Covenant never actually classified the Scarab as a vehicle itself, due to the fact that it wasn't really driven, but was a living construct. You can see this especially well with the Deuteros Pattern's central core, seeing the thousands of worms interconnected and writhing through the machinery. For the Covenant, they viewed these constructs as extremely important and valuable. Unsurprisingly, given their namesake, the ancient Egyptians viewed the Scarab with an almost unequal eminence. The Scarab Belonging to the family of Scarabidae was a beetle that showed unique and mystical qualities with it. More specifically, the Egyptian dung beetle, one of over 35,000 species of beetle, was this candidate for such importance within Egypt's culture and cult worship. As the sacred scarab was often seen rolling a ball of animal dung along the sands and dunes, Many in the ancient world, some 4,000 years ago, saw this as a representation of the rising sun. This would create an aspect of the sun god Ra, a separate god known as Kepri, the scarab-faced god. And just as Ra was the god of creation, so too was Kepri. The difference, however, was that Kepri represented rebirth. For as the new morning sun rises, the day is reborn for his worshippers. What made this representation was the fact that the dung beetles would lay their eggs inside the ball of dung, and yes, as disgusting as it is, the eggs would hatch and the scarabs would eat their way out. When emerging from the bowl, the scarabs would be fully grown adults, thus creating the image of rebirth and creation. What's interesting is that many in ancient Egypt, especially during the New Kingdom, fiercely believed that wearing a scarab amulet or being buried with one upon death would allow the person to be reborn, either in this life or within the afterlife. In addition, Kepri and his tokens of the scarab rings and amulets were seen as protectors of the people such as good luck charms and protection charms. This is seen not only with the Egyptian people, but as well with Roman soldiers, as it's believed that many legionnaires during this time of Rome's alliance with Egypt acclimated to Egyptian belief, with many soldiers being uncovered wearing scarab rings or having them in their possession, all 
in an effort to protect them during battle or provide new life upon their own death. I'd like to say a big thank you for watching this video and showing your support by liking, commenting, and subscribing. To learn more about Halo and its many connections, click the video right here. And if you'd like to become a patron, then follow the link in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.